What's going on, G. Craig? How you doing? Ah, cool, cool. It's a blessing to be sitting here with you, man. Um, been following your ministry for, for quite a while now, and I noticed that you have a boldness that's been absent in the church for such a time. And um, you say things that most ministers just wouldn't say. So my question is, how was your ministry birthed, especially in a time when the church has become so socially conservative, so politically safe, and so um, non-offensive? Well, um, our ministry started uh, 13 years ago. Um, and the ministry was birthed by me just speaking the message that God had given to me. Um, and I wasn't really concerned about what people thought at the time. Yeah. And I wasn't looking for any kind of uh, status or anything. I wasn't a part of any organization. And so those things were key into who I am now and what I'm able to do now with the ministry. If you look back 13 years ago, you'll see that what we do now is identical. Nothing has changed. And that's because we're unplugged. Yeah. And when you're unplugged from the church matrix, then you're able to uh, be free to say what God wants you to say and not worry about the ambitions of men getting in their way, not worry about the platforms of men being enticing. Uh, I don't seek the platform of men. I don't seek men's validation. I don't seek affirmation of men, positions, bishops, this, that, this, to be a bishop, to be a uh, whatever position. I just do what God says. And when you delete the ambitions of men from your um, agenda, then you're able to freely flow as God requires you to flow and say what God wants you to say, not worried about what, you know, what position you're going to get or where, what doors will shut because you're telling the truth. Yeah. 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 Having, um, having been given assignments such as yours, um, which at times can seem quite polarizing, uh, which I don't say that in a negative way because even the message that Jesus preached was polarizing. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you deal with the criticism, especially that comes from within the church? Um, I deal with it just like they dealt with it in the Bible. You know, God, uh, um, Jesus told the disciples, when, when you're not received in a town, you just shake the dust and yeah. you move on. And that's what we do. You know, um, uh, I just move on and I, I, I keep my focus on the people yeah. because my opposition only comes from leaders and leaders that have too much influence over people. Wow. So I, I make sure as long as the people are my central focus and what God wants me to do and say to them is our central focus, then I don't really worry about uh, you know, what, what the leaders say or what others say. And I understand their offense, you know, yeah. um, to be just straight up with you. Um, if I was to build a $50 million uh, facility, a church, and I have to keep people in there to pay for it, I understand the, there's a certain message you have to preach. There's a certain level of compromise you have to adhere to yeah. because God is not going to pay the bill for you. People are going to pay the bill. So you got to change your met method and everything to, to, to maintain that building. So I understand where they're coming from. They're yeah. offended by my message because what we preach hinders or gets in the way of their earthly success. Well, I'm not concerned about earthly success because to me, that's the enemy of God. Not saying that we shouldn't be successful. I live a debt free life. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be successful, but I'm saying that we got to keep the message first and the truth first. And we don't want our ambitions to put us in a position to have to compromise in order to sustain what we have decided we wanted to build and do. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, Real quick, um, looking at the spiritual condition of the 21st century church, in your opinion, what happened? <laughs> well, it's the same thing. It's, uh, I put a quote on uh, a Facebook uh, the other day, and um, uh, I, I want to read it, if, if that's, that's okay. Yeah, that's um, this is something that God just woke me up in the morning and told me, and he said, until we learn to discern between the ambitions of men versus the will of God, we will constantly look for men to grant us a position instead of God granting us our purpose. And what that's saying is exactly what we're talking about. The era came when men tried to take what belongs to God and take it into the world and gain the world support of it. Well, Jesus said that the world is going to hate us because it hated him. Yeah. So we can't seek for the approval of the world. We want to change lives, but if we want to change lives, we have to use the power of the Holy Spirit because he said, no man cometh unless the Spirit of the Lord draws him. Right. Well, now we have all these vehicles that are men drawing, trying to draw the world. Men are using methods. They're using hip-hop to try to draw yeah. the world. They're using 
reality shows now, Christian reality shows. They're using, you know, trying to reach them through music. All of these things are not biblical. Yeah. And the saddest part is when a person calls themselves a minister or they say what they're doing is God, they pick up the Bible and they cannot find an example of who they are and what they do. That, that's the saddest part to me because I can pick up the Bible and find an example of what I do all day long. Um, calling out names, being blatant, being, this is what Paul did. Yeah, Paul called yeah. out Hymenius and Alexander and everyone else that was, you know, selling idols in the church or they were selling idols to God's people or they were idol makers like Alexander. These guys that were fighting against the gospel, Paul called their names out blatantly and uh, Jesus called them out. He called the Pharisees out. He told them, hey, I know y'all's agenda. I know what y'all are doing in the dark. And so these kinds of things I can find example of. Yeah. So I can rest in that. So when I wake up in the morning, if somebody's dogging me out and saying something bad about me, I pick up the word and I see myself. Yeah. And that encourages me. But when you got a music singing ministry and you're traveling and saying that God has called you to, to have a music ministry, you pick up the Bible, you can't find that. You say God has called you to use music to win souls for Christ, you pick up the Bible, you can't find that. You know, you <laughs> That's because that's not in there. Not saying that there's anything wrong with music, yeah. but the audience you're trying to target, that's not biblical. It's not biblical to take your music and try to reach the strange, the strange land. The Bible says that uh, the, uh, um, in uh, Psalms, 1 and, uh, Psalms 138, 137, he said, we can't sing Zion songs in a strange land. We're in Babylon. We can't sing these songs here. And they're trying to force us to sing. They're trying to force us to perform. They want to see us because it makes them feel like the God of gods is with them yeah. if they have the church folks music with them. And that's what secular artists okay. are trying to make gospel artists do. That's why they want to sing with them. That's why they want to record with them. That's why every major record company forces the gospel artists to record with the secular. Wow. Because you're giving us validation and saying we're okay. But the children of Zion said, we can't do that in, in, in the Psalms. He said, we can't sing in a strange land because then we're offering you validation and we can't validate these false gods. Yeah. And so when they pick up the Bible at the end of the day, they can't find themselves. And so they need man's promotion. So they have to target certain men with position. They have to target certain executives and please them and try to, you know, do whatever, whether it's homosexual act, sexual act, whatever they got to do, they have to please the world in order to get that uh, that affirmation to get to the next place. Yeah. I don't have to do that, brother. Yeah. I open up the word, I find what I need to do, and I just do it. That's good, that's good. I'm glad you went that direction. Um, let's focus for a minute on the, on the music industry, um, more particularly the gospel recording artists. Um, what are some of the things that you feel that God is just not pleased with them? In? Um, well, you know, uh, the, the gospel industry, man, that's just so much to say <laughs> know, on that because there is no gospel industry. Right. There's a secular music industry and the gospel industry is owned by it. Right. And so whenever the devil takes control of God's music, you know, um, God has really no say in it. These people are forced by contracts and they don't understand. Well, most people don't understand the word contract is not the word that is on the contracts that they read. The, the word that is on the contracts that the gospel artists sign is covenant. Wow. So they're signing covenant agreements. And their covenant agreement is that not only will we give you our ability and let you own it, or our music and let you own it, but anyone else that is in your association, we're in covenant agreement with them too. See, because there's an interest that the record company has to protect. So if I got Gaga on Sony, and I want Kurt Franklin on so Sony. Kurt Franklin has to sign a covenant agreement to say, I will support Gaga and I will not speak against what Gaga's done. Wow. So you've automatically sold your lips shut for the sake of fame and promotion. What kind of minister are you and you can't preach against the biggest, uh, the, 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 the pink elephant in the room? Yeah. You know, which is Gaga and Chris Brown and, and Young Jeezy and all these guys that are promoting sin, sex, lust and perversion. You got to record with them and you can't even speak against them. Yeah. And you say that God called you to do that. That's the biggest contradiction I've ever heard. And that's why I, I'm like, the further they go, the further away from God they get. Yeah. So for a gospel, record, a, a gospel recording artist, what would you say would be the right way for them to go about it? <laughs> well, you know, sometimes things can get so whacked out until there is not an easy solution or easy fix for it. 
um, and that's where gospel music is now. God's divine plan, uh, what he's illustrated to me, would be for the church to own the music. If every pastor got behind their own musicians, took some of that Bentley money, yeah. and <laughs> built the recording studio, and recorded their own songs, wrote their own songs. Have you noticed? Why is every church, millions of churches, all singing the same song? David says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Why are we all singing the same stuff? Yeah. That's because that's control. That's what the devil wants. He wants us coming to him for the music for our churches. Wow. But what if musicians got inspired to do their own music? What if they did their own songs and recorded them? Then there'd be no industry control. There'd be no satanic lording over our music and churches would be free to pass them, exchange the music with each other, kill the superstar element, and you wouldn't have this issue. You know, you got a man like T.D. Jakes. This man's a multimillionaire and has the largest Christian audience out of all black preachers. But what does he do when he wants music? He signed a deal. Does that even make sense? Huh. No, uh, not at all. If he was to put the song on TV, if he was to just release the song through his own avenues, what does he need the industry taking 70, 80 percent of his money for? Yeah. It's validation and control. The devil has to have control. So this man could revolutionize it all, but he won't. Because in order to get where he got, he had to say he wouldn't do that. Yeah. And that's, that's just the, that's the sad part. So there's not an easy fix for me to just give an, art, uh, an uh, artist a pathway. But if you could get into a church where the pastor would support you and release you in that church and let the ministries be your support, then you would have control over your content and the enemy wouldn't be controlling it. Yeah, that's biblical. Um, thinking about how David had full-time singers and musicians on staff in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's biblical. I can f definitely feel you on that. Um, one of the questions um, I ask a lot of people, um, if you could sit down with, with, um, with G. Craig Lewis, what would you ask him? What would you ask him? And one of the questions that just kept popping up was, um, can God use gospel rap? Um, I have gospel rappers at my church, man. Yeah. I have some of the best. Uh, I love gospel rap. Yeah. Um, I don't have a problem with a genre of music, a style. A music style is not the issue. The issue is hip hop. Gotcha. Because hip hop is a subculture that is birthed through anti-God worship. Gotcha. And so for brothers to try to Christianize a subcultural movement, it would be the same as trying to make goth holy. Yeah. Goth is subculture. Goth is the celebration of death and destruction. Why would you make that holy? When you're saved as a gothite, are you holy goth? So then how can you be holy hip hop? Yeah. Hip hop was birthed for the lack of father. Hip hop took the place of the father, showed you how to dress, talk, act. Hip hop, you know, puts you in a position to, to not excel in the parent culture, but you're only relevant in the subculture. Yeah. That's not God. Christianity is a counterculture. That means when we accept Christ, we become a new creation. We move away from all subcultures. Yeah. It's not an authentic culture like Chinese or Japanese. You don't have your own language or your own, you know, your own demographic. Yeah. No, this is a degradation of a parent culture. So why do you think people just don't get that? Because they, they don't have no father. <laughs> if hip hop is their father. Yeah. It gave them identity. That's what a father gives. It affirmed them. That's what a father does. It validates them. That's what a father does. It tells them how to wear their hair, how to dress, how to walk. It gives yeah. them swagger. Yeah. That's confidence. That's what a father does. Yeah. A father gives you that. And when you mirror image your father and you walk in the image of your father, then you become him and you identify with who he is. And that gives you relevance. Yeah. You're not worried about what the world thinks about you if your father's love, if your father's in love with you. Right. Well, hip hop loved them like that. It loved them out of bad areas. It loved them out of bad circumstances. It was there for them. It's all they did. Listen to the music, wrote the raps, and they fell in love with a subcultural brand, and now they can't divorce themselves from it. Wow. Yeah. Another question that came up a lot was um, people want to know what type of mu what music do you listen to? What artists do you like? What <laughs> artists personally does G. Craig Lewis listen to when he's riding down the street in his car? <laughs> well, when I'm riding down the street, I'm listening to. Talk radio, that's me. <laughs> sports that's me. radio. That's me. I'm listening to sports radio. I love sports, man. Uh, but 
when I when I choose music, listen to music, I listen to old school stuff. I'm a commission, old school commission fan, uh, wine and old school Andre Crouch, that kind of thing. If you know, but uh, the majority of the music I listen to is you know our music. You know, gotcha. we have a lot of talented uh, artists at our own church That's as well awesome. as as I travel. You know, because at our church, we do all originals every Sunday. We That's do good. our own songs, our own music. We have our recording studio. We're about to start recording our own stuff. That's awesome. You know, because I feel like, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just not one to talk about things. If God enlightens me on something, I'm going to do it. Yeah. So as I travel, people give me music, a lot of independent music, and I listen to that. I don't listen to any industry artists because I don't have any confidence in, uh, in their record executives. I don't trust them. I had a guy come to me uh, years ago who worked for uh, Sony uh, Relativity, and he was, they, they brought a record on and set it on his desk, a gold record, and it was 666 Mafia. Wow. And um, he looked at it and he said, man, that's the mark of the beast. Now, this guy makes six figures, and this was his first time noticing it. So he searched the internet and he found me. And he called me, he said, I'm a record exec at Sony, he said. And, I just noticed this is the mark of the beast, man, and what am I doing? I told him, I said, man, you're worse than a drug dealer. I said, wow. you're selling degradation into the lives of our kids. I said, you're destroying children. He said, well, what do I do? I said, you quit. <laughs> He's like, man, I make six figures. I, this. I said, dude, quit. And that just shocks people. You know, they're like, and I had a lot of preachers tell me, man, you should have just told them you can make a difference. You can make, you can't make no difference and the devil owns the thing. Yeah. You know, when, when, when the devil offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, the devil said, their mind to give. Yeah. He wasn't lying. He's the God of this world. Yeah. So that industry is his. So you don't need you trying to make a difference in that industry. That industry belongs to him. So I told the dude, quit. He ended up, you know, leaving. And he told me a whole lot of things. And one thing he told me, he said, man, when these guys do their gospel music, he said, they really think they're glorifying God. He said, but their music goes into the mastering house just like all the rest. So I said, what happens in the mastering house? He said, they set their music on the ground and put candles around it. And dedicated to Satan, and they offer it up to the devil. He said all music has to go through, all music that is a part of the, 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 the big conglomerate, the industry, has to be offered to Satan before it's released. I said, why do they offer it to Satan? He said, because he owns it. He owns it. Yeah. Now this guy works there. So I'm like, I don't have confidence in gospel music no more, man. These people have gotten so ambitious, and they want to they, they just want to make it so bad that drive in them to be big and you got them leaving gospel going secular. You got them mixing gospel with secular. You got all this stuff that we're seeing now that we've been talking about for the past 13 years. It's so bad right now. You turn on the BET celebration of gospel and Steve Harvey's hosting it and, and all the homosexuality and just all the filth and foolishness and folks drunk and high up there performing. Man, it's just so bad until I personally don't have confidence. Now, I don't tell my church or tell our audience, don't listen to this. Or don't, I don't tell people what to listen to. That's up to everyone. If you're not convicted, that's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. But for me, you ask me the question, what yeah. I listen to, I don't listen to industry folks because I don't have confidence in them. I've watched them change right before my eyes. I've been knowing Kurt for many years, and I watch him change everything he told me he was going to do right before my eyes. I talked to Truth and Ambassador, these rappers. We, we, we had a very good relationship. I mean, we were working together on a lot of things. And I talked to him for two hours on the phone and tried to get these guys to divorce themselves from hip hop. I said, man, do the Christian rap, man. Just drop the hip hop. Why are you yeah. And they wouldn't do it. So I just, I can't do it, man. I just, I have to back away and I, I just can't support something that I know eventually is going to come to a screeching halt because the only reason the devil's going to buy you up is to put you out. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I know that you said um, commission. So I'm pretty sure you probably don't listen to the new Fred Hammond CD. Uh, what is it, Love, God? Man, and I, that, I, <laughs> I, I almost flew that CD out the window like a Frisbee. Yeah. That, that, that's, the, that's the most foolish thing I've, I've seen in gospel. Uh, it was one of the little segments in that CD that I heard. This girl was saying how she's depressed because her man had left her. And then the next scene, she said, they're walking, and the other girl said, ooh, look, 3 o'clock, and they see this guy, and she's, you know, what place does that have in the kingdom of God? Why, why are we even entertaining lust or yeah, lusting right. after another person right after you got out of one? You know, why, why, why are we going in that direction? Because people are desperate for fame, they're desperate for relevance, 
and they're trying to match what the world is doing because the industry is owned by the world. So yeah. if you're a part of that machine, you got to match the world in order to stay, order to stay relevant. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Here's a um, hot button issue that the church usually avoids, but um, what's your stance on homosexuals serving in ministry? <laughs> <laughs> what's my... Uh, <laughs> and I know your stance. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, man, and it ain't just homosexuality, but any kind of perversion yeah. doesn't need a place serving in ministry. Yeah. But the homosexual is different. And any man that makes or equates homosexuality with other sins, I question him. We look in the Bible and they all want to say all sins are the same. The Bible never says that. The Bible categorizes sin. It even says the sin against your own body is worse uh, than other sins. So the Bible categorizes sin, and then the consequences of sin are all different. Homosexuality is different because what other, what other sin has a, has a pride movement attached to it? Yeah. You know, adulterers getting together and marching <laughs> and demanding rights. <laughs> Thieves not getting together and marching and changing all the laws of the nation. That tells me that there is something particular about this homosexual issue. I discuss it in my video, Era of Man. This is about to come out. But I discuss it. There's something different. There's a reason God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and he didn't destroy any of the other nations because of sin, but he just, uh, uh, because of homosexuality. But he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah specifically because of homosexuality, because there's something totally different about it. When a man takes on the wrong image, he divorces himself of God's image and it makes the sin more grave and the only way a homosexual can multiply is through touching or being indecent with with other men and this yeah. is why you don't allow them not only to serve but if they're in that lifestyle you don't allow them in church the church is not the place for them the church is supposed to be a fellowship of believers if a sinner comes in there then we, we want to get them saved but they the sinner shouldn't feel comfortable coming week after week and being entertained by the servants no, he should be very uncomfortable until they give their life to the Lord. But we've created seeker-friendly atmospheres because they need that paper. Right. Because they built these big buildings and they got to pay those bills. Yeah, yeah. That's good, that's good. Um, back to the, the 21st century church um, as it pertains to, you know, the modern church. How can we get back to the place where God desires us to be? I'm talking about back to a place where the full power of God is flowing through the body. Back to Acts chapter 2 type church. Whew. Um, to be honest, it, it, that, we're too far gone. I, I, I believe as a body yeah. of a group, we may be a little too far gone, but as individuals, we're never too far gone. I believe individuals have to get their focus back on Christ. I, you know, the saddest part about preachers being overly ambitious and building these big synagogues and make, you know, needing the people to fund them is that the people are the ones that lose because they get an edited truth, they get an edited gospel, and then they themselves begin to chase selfish ambition. And selfish ambition, ambition is enmity with God. It's, and so if we're going to serve God truly, we have to operate what I call, what I teach our church, I call it our creation roles. You know, God created us all for a specific purpose, and until we fulfill that, we won't be happy. You know, we won't be fulfilled. We won't have the joy of the Lord. And so we got to get back to occupying in our creation roles and allowing God to really use us to reach this world by example. And uh, that's that's the best we can do in a pagan society in Babylon. The best we can do is to illustrate who God really is by our day-to-day -day walk. That's good. That's good. It's been great sitting down with you, G. Craig Lewis. All right, Doc. Appreciate it, man.